already. So um, this one will be a little bit briefer. And uh, like Chris was saying, just a time for some questions and answers. And I'd actually like to do that in a way that maybe even involves some of you answering questions. You know, I think that you're mature saints and you're um, fighting to walk with God. And, and so I don't have a corner on this market. So if there's some things that you just like, oh, I want you to expound on this, or um, I might say, hey, any of the pastors here want to chime in, you know, and we'll just kind of do that kind of together. So we'll finish with that. And then I'd also like to finish with some prayer time, as we started last night with prayer, um, as we believe in a God who does mighty things, and saving work is mighty things, correct? And so we need to uh, study the word, absolutely, uh, but we also need to press into the power of God in prayer, and just really ask God, okay, so plant these truths in our hearts, um, but then actually give us the faith and the boldness to act out on them, right? Right? Um, and so we, we don't want to be reservoirs of God's truth. We want to be uh, rivers, if you will, of God's truth. We want to have his truth coming in and flowing out of us, not just gaining bigger heads, right? Not gaining more information. So um, for our time, this session, our final time together, um, we're going to look again at kind of as we did last time um, as how gospel fluency um, and how that interacts with religious people. That was our last session in John three. Um, but we're going to look th this session as gospel fluency compels us to, excuse me, go towards need and not comfort. Okay. This is a, a, a phrase that a friend of mine preached on um, from Hebrews chapter 12. I think it really fits for so many themes in scripture. And so we're going to unpack this together, that gospel fluency compels us to go towards need and not comfort. More on that in just a minute. Um, would you agree that the world's full of brokenness? Yes. Any of us broken? <laughs> yeah, it's like we're, the world's full of brokenness. Um, the brokenness of the world is not somewhere out there. It's very real, very personal. Um, we are all broken in different ways and by different things. We could talk about brokenness even in this room and say, how many of us have broken families? How many of us have broken marriages? How many of us have broken finances? How many of us have broken health? The world's broken. Um, and, and as followers of Christ, we, we know that ultimately the host of all the, or the cause of all this brokenness really is the fall. That's the cause of all brokenness. Before the fall, before Genesis 3 happens, the, there is no brokenness, right? And uh, not to get too, you know, off topic, but uh, I think a real, uh, a true eschatology is going back to the world's no longer broken. All right, so we could disagree on how it gets there, but at the end of time, it's no longer broken. Christ returns, and it will be restored. All things will be as they should be, no longer broken, right? So the world's broken because of the fall. And our sin, and not, not only is there general brokenness caused by the fall, there's specific brokenness that is, that's actually caused by the sin in each of our lives. Sometimes our brokenness is the result of bad choices, correct? Correct? Now, we don't like to admit it, but it's the reality. We make bad choices, and then we suffer brokenness because of it. And in our flesh, we try to blame other people for those brokenness, or the consequences, right? Well, it's her fault, it's his fault, it's my boss's fault. No, it's actually, you chose to, you chose to sin, you're suffering the result of that, call, that, those consequences, and it looks like brokenness. Um, sometimes our brokenness is the cause of other people. You can be sinned against, Right? So you're not actively sinning, but somebody's sinning against you, and so it's producing brokenness in your experience, right? So maybe it's a relationship, a family member, a coworker. Um, it could be a stranger who just steals from you or robs. The world's broken, and you're being sinned against. Um, and then we would say there's brokenness that's frankly not because of your sin directly or somebody's sin against you. It's just a broken world. And we would maybe look at diseases and say that, right? There's brokenness. Our bodies are broken. Um, and sometimes it's not because of our sin or the sin of somebody else. It's just brokenness. And the reason I, I'm, I'm bringing that up is, is um, I think as we open the Bible together now back in John chapter 4, uh, we're going to see that the gospel speaks to broken people. And the reason this is important is that I, I, I'm under, I'm, I could be off here, but my analysis of Western Christianity, all right, Western Christianity, which is what we would be underneath here in America, we've become a very happy-go-lucky Christianity. 
we're, we're very, um, like I mentioned, positive and encouraging in our, in, in our Christianity. Um, we're actually kind of afraid to talk about brokenness and pain. Right. And so people get the idea that Christianity is really just this like happy go lucky, joy, joy all the time, faith, and that we can't be real that the world's broken. I mean, in a way, we, we've kind of played into the, uh, the, the famous words of, I think it was Karl Marx, right? That religion's the opiate of the masses. And that's what we've just devolved into. We're just like, let's just be happy go lucky all the time in the name of Jesus. But then in our experience, it's a mess. Right? So we can pick on things like, let's say, the prosperity movement, the prosperity gospel movement, um, where it's like they're promising, but they never deliver. So you go to church, you get excited, you get amped up, you, you really hope that God will do what you want, but, and then you're just left disappointed because it just didn't work out. So you try again next week. And we can criticize them, but sometimes I think we're, we're similar. We're not really willing to just sit in the brokenness of this world and to sit with broken people. And the gospel frees us to do that. Throughout the Bible, we have a God who speaks into real grief, real pain, real brokenness, this side of heaven. And so how does that connect to missional living? Well, thanks for asking. Um, we actually have the one thing that all people are longing for in a broken world. Hope. We have hope. And, and his name is Jesus. We have lasting, eternal, not based on your circumstances, hope. And so like Jesus, I think we need to become practitioners of offering living water to the hopeless. We got to become good at how do we actually offer hope to broken people? Not hope that God will give them a new car or not hope that God will cure them of their pain, but hope that they'll be right with God for all eternity. How do we give people hope? Because as the song says, right, the world is looking for love in all the wrong places. They're looking for joy in all the wrong places. They're looking for hope in all the wrong places. And we're the only ones, and I don't mean this in a proud way, it's only God's mercy and grace. We're the only ones in the world that have the answers. And it's in the word of God. It's this thing we call the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so this world is trying to fix their problems by drinking from broken cisterns that can never satisfy. And so... What I want to kind of finish our time together is kind of, kind of looking now at how we take the gospel to the broken. Because we, we looked earlier at John 3, the gospel to the religious people, but how does the gospel compel us to actually go towards need and not comfort? Because if we're honest, none of us go towards needy people. I mean, we talk about bearing each other's burdens, right? Let's just play this out, though. Tomorrow morning, we gather as a church family, and you ask somebody how they're doing. And they just pour out the hopelessness of their week. <laughs> You're like, go talk to a pastor. <laughs> it's awkward, right? When somebody actually begins to tell you about the brokenness of their week, even as a brother or sister in Christ, you're like, oh, this is really weird. I just wanted you to say I'm doing good. I had a good week, right? But if we actually are going to bear each other's burdens, then we're going to, life's hard right now. My marriage isn't well, or my kids aren't well, or I'm, I'm broke as a joke, and I'm having a hard time making my payments, and, and you're going to actually bear each other's burdens. Like, there's hopelessness in this world, but we don't, in our flesh, we don't gravitate towards hopelessness, right? We're just like, hey, let's stay on the surface, and let's, let's talk about positive good things. And I think as people who know the gospel, who have been freed by the gospel, we have the ability to go towards need, not comfort. We can reach out and actually care, not just for each other in need, but for a world that's in need. So let's just learn from Jesus a little bit. We're going to look at two stories, John 4 and John 9. In John 4, we've mentioned this over and over. It's such a key gospel story in the life of Christ. Um, John 4, we see how this, and I'm, I'm just going to call this gospel fluency, because Christ is fluent in the gospel, and it moves him towards people broken by sin. That's what John 4, I believe, is really about. Christ being moved towards a woman who is broken by sin. Let's just look at a few highlights of John 4. Verse 4 is just, it jumps off the page at me. And he had to pass through Samaria. He didn't really have to. There was another road. 
And the Jews were very familiar with taking the other road because as you might know, they hated Samaritans. But for Christ, no, he had to. There was a reason. He was on mission from God. After all, he always did the Father's will. He has to go through Samaria. Notice the urgency of what Christ had to do. It was a must do, a must go. I've got to go right through the heart of this place called Samaria. It just causes me even right there to to ask myself the question, do I live my life with such gospel awareness? I have to do this. I have to go here. Now, we're not Christ. We don't know that there's a divine opportunity waiting for us. But I do wonder if we lived our days a little more like this. Well, I have to do this because I believe by faith that you're going to put people in my path who need Christ. You're You're putting people all around me providentially that need the Savior. I mean, in this little book, Honest Evangelism, Rico Tice has a great section on how in the book of Acts and that sermon that Paul gives, if, if you're not far, right, that God is not far from you. So he takes an application of that that I just thought was brilliant. And he talks about how God's not far from your neighbor because you're their neighbor. God's not far from your coworker because you're their coworker. This isn't some mystic, funny business. Oh, God's not far because, you know, God's everywhere present at the same time. No, he's not far because you're in their life. It's like, oh, Jesus has this urgency. I've got to go through Samaria. Why? Because there's a woman who's going to need me. And I was just like, Lord, what if we actually lived our life with such gospel urgency all the time? And if we begin to live our lives that way, I think these are one of those promises of Scripture or one of the principles of Scripture that God would guarantee to be faithful for. He'll put people in your path that need Christ. If we live our life with that, oh, I've got to go here. I've got to do this kind of urgency that we see in John 4, 4. So then Jesus, he's got to go here. You may know the story. Look down at verse 7. He's at the well. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Here, just a very simple truth. Jesus initiates the conversation with this woman. Jesus didn't wait for the woman to initiate the conversation. He didn't wait for her to say, hey, aren't you a Jewish rabbi like Nicodemus said? He used a very natural conversation starter to begin engaging this woman in conversation. Now, we could get into the cultural context that even that question was probably beyond what would normally happen. Possibly. We don't know for sure. But for this man to be talking to a woman, that might have been taboo, especially a woman of her repute. Hey, we don't know all that, but Jesus is just saying, hey, I'm I'm, I'm a stranger here. I need somebody to draw me water. Would you please draw me water to quench my thirst? And he initiates conversation with this woman. And I just find this interesting because Jesus is not giving us a technique, but I think he's modeling how to do everyday life and bring the gospel into it. And it's just like probably a normal first century interaction. You're at the well. You don't have a, you know, you don't have, not, everybody's not carrying water bottles in the first century like we do today. Hey, I don't have a bucket. You have a bucket. Can you give me some water to drink? A very everyday, normal conversation. But Christ knows what he's doing, right? He's going he's gonna to get her to the gospel here pretty quick. So he initiates the conversation. And I think, honestly, brothers and sisters, as we think about this, um, we shouldn't expect the world to move towards us. We should move towards them. We should expect the unbeliever to remain aloof and selfish and distant because they have no reason to move towards us. Who knows the love of God? Us. Who's called to love their enemy? Us. Who's commanded to love their neighbor? Us. So I know I've been guilty of this. I'm like, okay, Lord, well, would you just bring them to me? I don't think that's a prayer that we should be praying. Okay, fine. Maybe plead with God, but maybe it's like, hey, I'm actually, you're the one to go out. You're the one to have the awkward, hey, how, hey, what's your name? Hey, where are you from? Like, you're the one to initiate. Jesus initiates with this woman, doesn't wait for her to come after it. In verse 9, we see this woman is shocked that Jesus would even talk to her. The woman of Samaria said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for me a drink, a woman of Samaria? So we're getting some more clues here, right? Oh, maybe, maybe now we're going to see a little more of the picture. The woman is taken back. Wow. Now it's a Jew, Jew Samaritan thing. There's some racial hostility that goes back a long ways. We don't get along well. You're a man, I'm a woman. What are you doing talking to me? I just find it interesting that when you cross cultural norms to talk about Jesus, you'll often have to get over what, what I just call the shock moment. Whoa, what are you doing? This is weird. 
I mean, I've even found this today. If I'm just trying to be friendly with somebody at the park and my kids are playing, we, can, we live in a culture that's kind of distant. You just try to, like, make conversation. And at first, people are like, you selling something? You're part of some MLM scheme? Like, why are you being so friendly? And it's like, no, I just, I just wanted to love people. So even there, it's like, we can get this today. And we're the ones that should be, be putting ourselves out there in that sense. Hey, I'm just wanting to love all people. And I think it might be interesting to just, and we don't have time for this now, but it's like, well, what are the things today that this is culturally weird? Okay, so we're weird. I mean, Jesus is like, hey, I'm crossing cultural norms, I'm crossing cultural customs, but it's okay. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. We're going to talk gospel right now. So, hey, there are times where it's like, ah, it feels weird to talk to this person at the store about Christ, but you know what? Nobody's behind me in line. I'm not making, I'm not holding up anybody. All right, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, it feels weird right now because it's kind of going beyond the normal checkout. Hey, how you doing? But if this is what you want me to do, I'll submit to you. Right? It's weird. They might think, you might walk away and they're like, that was weird. Okay. But you're submitting to what God's placing on your heart in that moment to, to do and talk about Christ. So the woman questions it in verse 9. What does Jesus do? Well, he immediately offers her lasting hope. That's what he immediately does. And I love this because this is different than what he does to Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus, he goes straight for the new birth. He, he goes after, you think you can, you're righteous by your works. Let me tell you how you're right with God. So remember, he's not changing the gospel, but he's, he knows what to emphasize with each person. So to the woman at the well, oh, he goes straight after lasting hope. And he says to her, if you knew the gift of God and what it is that you are saying, or that is say, being saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and I would have given you living water. And the woman's like, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where, are you, where do you go to get th that living water? Still, like, a, like Nicodemus, she is confused. She doesn't quite get it yet and that's okay. But what Jesus does, and I think what we need to learn is when we're dealing with people broken by sin, Gospel fluency gets right to gospel hope. Notice how Jesus, with this woman, he doesn't condemn her first, but he offers hope first. She's already hopeless. Just let that sink in for a little bit, because I think sometimes we, we think we have to go for the jugular first. He doesn't do that. He just offers her hope. Here's living water. And she's confused, just like Nicodemus. She's like, really? Nicodemus is like, how do I get back inside my mother and come back out again? This is really weird. And, and this woman's like, you don't even have a bucket. She's still not tracking with Jesus. But he's offering her living hope, and, and she's like, ah, I'm not quite there yet. And, and that's where she says in verse 12, um, or verse 11, where, did, where would you get this living water? And then Jesus in verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, meaning the physical well, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There's the same thing Jesus promised Nicodemus, life eternal. And the woman now just says, sir, give me this water so that I'll, be, I'll not be thirsty or have to come to draw water. So again, she's still not getting it. But Jesus is pouring out hope. And again, I just want to kind of circle back on this. I think it's popular in some evangelistic circles today to kind of bring the heat, you might call it, bring condemnation first all the time. You've got to hammer people with the law before you give them grace. Jesus doesn't do that here. So if we're going to learn from the master, this is how he does it here. He, his, his tool bag is full of gospel tools, of gospel methodologies, you might say. And so Jesus is winsome, he offers hope, and I believe he's doing exactly what 1 Peter 3.15 says. Be ready to give an answer for what? The hope that is in you, right? But how should you do it? With gentleness and respect. And if you follow the line of the text, it goes, so, it goes so, so that when they persecute you. So it doesn't mean everybody's going to love you. And just like go, whoa, you were so gentle and respectful, of course we believe in Jesus. No, but you're going to give an answer of the hope you have. Is Jesus speaking about hope here? He is. And he's doing it in this just wonderfully gentle and respectful way to this woman. Jesus is modeling 1 Peter 3.15. So Jesus offers hope. The woman is intrigued 
and actually wants it, but she's confused. Now, let's be clear. Jesus is, Jesus is moving towards this woman who is broken by sin, but he hasn't yet brought up sin, right? He started the conversation, and he's offered her hope. So what's he do next? Verse 16 to 18. And at this point of the conversation, Jesus calls out her sinful brokenness. Notice again, um, there's no smooth transition here. I don't know if you've ever read books on evangelism, but you know, there's, everybody's got their, their thing. And I've read a few where there's, they're all about the transition, how to go from point A to point B, and how to have a slick technique to weave the conversation. Jesus is so choppy, but it's okay. It's not about your slick approach. Look at the woman's like, the woman's just, sir, give me the water. And so Jesus just, okay, great point. Go call your husband. That's it. That's the, that's the transition moment, right? And the woman, you can just be like, what? Go call my husband. So what'd she say? Oh, the woman answers him. I have no husband. <laughs> Jesus says to her, you are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you're, you're now, that you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. So we must remember that when we offer the hope of the gospel, we're always going to address the sinful condition of the heart. For there's no hope apart from the reality of sin. So Jesus doesn't leave her with just hope and then walk away. No, he, he offers hope, but he's going to make it clear, I'm offering you hope for your brokenness. Your brokenness that's caused by sin. What I love about this, this woman in particular is as I've studied this and taught to it at our church, I believe this woman is broken because of two reasons. One, she's been sinned against. In the first century, a woman had no right to divorce her husband. The husband had the right. The woman's stuck. I mean, the guy could be an abuser. He could do whatever. The woman can't walk away. She's stuck in the marriage. But remember, the, 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 at that time, divorce was so common, you could just get rid of divorce and just, husband's done. I'm done with that woman. And she's out on the streets. So she's had five men burn her. No, this woman could have been wicked too. I'm sure it takes two to tango, right? So she, I'm not saying she was, a, she was the perfect wife, but five men have said, now we're done with you. Uh, no, we tried you, we're done with you. We're going to put you out on the street, put you out on the street, put you on the street. So really, there's no recourse for her, but I'll marry again, I'll marry again, I'll marry again. And finally, she says, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to live with somebody who's not my husband. I tried God's way, it didn't work. And is that not what our flesh does? God, I tried your way, and it didn't work. So I got my own way. So that's where this woman's at. I think we could fair, it'd be fair to say this woman has been sinned against and is suffering the brokenness of the world because she's been sinned against. And at the same time, she's suffering the brokenness of this world because she's a sinner. So it's not just this woman. She's so wicked. Yeah, she's a sinner, and she's been sinned against. And her life has all the scars of being sinned against and sinning. This kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? We interact with people, and we could honestly sit there with them and say, it's so hard to hear your story because you've been sinned against. You're experiencing the brokenness of living in a sinful world. And maybe for decades, you've been sinned against by family and spouses, and it's hard. But you're, you're part of that sinful problem too, aren't you? You've made choices that have actually cause brokenness in your life and cause pain and agony in your life. And so Jesus calls out her sinful brokenness. But notice, I think, I think we can see this in the character of Christ. There is a judgment in the right sense of the word. There's a judgment, but not a condescension. Jesus isn't beating this woman up. He's not hammering her. He's not like a shark, you know, out for blood. He's just saying it as it is. Hey, hey lady, go get your husband. Yeah, I don't have one. Yeah, I know you don't. You've had five and you're living with one who's not your husband. What you've said is true. He just, he, in a way, he, he actually exposes her sin and agrees with her. In a way, you're telling the truth. You don't have a husband, but I know that you've had a bunch of them. And so we, 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 like Christ, we're not looking down our noses at sinners. Honestly, it goes back to, I think, what we do often as the Christian church. We're like, oh, 
I mean, we may not say it, but like, they're gross. They're doing what? They're a nuisance to our way of life. And, and honestly, brothers and sisters, which goes back to what we talked about last night, apart from Christ, we're all the same, right? There was a time that we were hostile to God, whether that happened when you were five years old or 55 years old. We all, at one point, were in desperate need of gospel grace to redeem us. But I'm going to bring up something again before we move on from this. And this is where I think uh, Rico Tice does a great job in this little book when he talks about the pain point. Because every gospel, every gospel proclamation, every gospel conversation, I think to be faithful to the gospel must get to this pain point. Jesus could have offered the woman water and walked away. And she's like, well, that was the strangest conversation I've ever had. This man just offered me water that I would never get thirsty again. Huh, how interesting. And then she just goes on her day. And, and, and you could have concluded, oh, well, Jesus just loved this woman, and he gave her the gospel, and it was so sweet, and he offered her hope, and, and we're done. But he doesn't stop there. He crosses that threshold and says, you know, okay, here's where it's going to get personal. Go get your husband. Oh, I don't have one. Yeah, I know. You've had a bunch. What's he doing? He's calling out sin. You see, it's, it's at this point, I believe, that the Holy Spirit brings the conviction of sin and the longing to be set free. So we've got to go there. We've got to be willing to go there in some way, some shape, some form, get, get to what's uncomfortable, and, and actually just, we have this problem called sin. I don't know what your sin looks like. I can tell you what my sin looks like, but we have a sin problem, and that's why we need the hope of, excuse me, the hope of Christ. So notice what the woman does. As we think about caring for people broken by sin, broken by, the, by this world, this woman, classic evangelism, she changes the subject. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship, where people ought to worship. This is just humorous. The woman changes the subject and tries to sound spiritual all at the same time. And isn't that what we experience if you've evangelized much in your life. And it comes a point where they, people just get squirmy and then they try, to cut, they try to change the topic but still sound spiritual. That's exactly what she's doing. People love spirituality but on their own terms. So they might not just say, oh, I hate Jesus, curse him and die. But they're going to squirm out of it. I mean, my, my wife's hairdresser, uh, we've been praying for her salvation for 10 years. Um, you can pray for her. Her name is Brittany. Um, this poor woman believes, literally believes in praying to the universe. She just prays to the universe. I'm like, what are you, what is that? She believes the universe gave her twins. And that, you know, if she keeps praying to the universe, she might get the one more child that she wants because she thinks the universe told her that she's going to have a fifth kid. And she loves spirituality. And when you talk to her, she just goes all mystical and spiritual but she, she just doesn't want to submit to Jesus as Lord. So she's going to be spiritual, and yet in her spirituality, her life's a mess, and her moral compass is all over the place. But then there's times she's, she, she really wants to know, well, what do you do with this sin or this behavior? She won't use the word sin, but this seems wrong, but I don't know how to define wrong. And it's like, oh, this poor woman's soul, she's all good with spirituality, but not Jesus. And that's what we see here in the text. The woman, she's all, oh, well, let's talk about where we should worship. Which one's more spiritual? Which one gets me closer to God? And so I think as we learn from Christ, we need to be ready that those who don't know Jesus, they're going to change the subject when the conversation gets uncomfortable. And that's okay. We're like, oh, we blew it. No, we should par for the course. They did it to Jesus. They, they're going to do it to us. So she changes the subject and Jesus, continuing to pressing into this woman's need, he doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't confront her. He doesn't say, stop distracting, stop derailing. He just says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. What a great, what a great line. The Father is seeking, right? God is seeking worshipers. God is the great missionary God. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Then the woman tries to sound spiritual again. I know the Messiah is coming. 
When he comes, he'll tell us all things. So she's trying to sound spiritual again. And this is actually profound. And we could, again, spend all day here. Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. The first time Christ reveals that he's the Messiah is to a Samaritan woman at a well in a town where Jews weren't supposed to go to a woman he's not supposed to talk to. He didn't, re- he didn't reveal that to Nicodemus. He reveals it to the woman at the well. I mean, it's just beautiful. The heart of God for the broken is all over this text. Jesus calls out her spiritual brokenness. The woman tries to change the subject. And Jesus, in such mercy, reveals to this woman that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so notice how Jesus doesn't leave this woman in her sin. Jesus calls her to worship, to worship the one true God. See, that goes back to life on God's terms. We all worship something. You either worship yourself and the God of your own imagination, you give glory, that's Romans 3, you give glory to self or you give glory to God. There's no middle ground. And so Jesus calls this woman to worship him, the one true God, the God who is seeking worshipers. Notice what happens in verse 27. The disciples come back and they marveled. They're amazed that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? And so here we even see that the followers of Jesus, the disciples, they're shocked by Jesus' total disregard for cultural norms. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but I think what we see here in Christ is there's times that you're going to share the gospel and either, even other Christians are going to go, oh, you shouldn't do that. Hey, let me, let me tell you that that's actually unacceptable in our culture. We would do this a different way. Jesus is not, he's not interested in that. He's not interested in the question of the, he's not interested in the cultural norms that these disciples are following. He's just proclaiming the gospel to this woman in her brokenness. And as we looked at last night, she responds, come see this man, just come, come and see, he told me all that I've ever done. She believes, and the town, many in the town believe. And so I think a few takeaways from this text would be gospel fluent people are prayerfully looking for opportunities to share Jesus with broken people. After all, Jesus came not to call the righteous, but who? Sinners. Now, the, the, pun, the, 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 the tongue-in-cheek there is, is anybody actually righteous? No, not apart from faith. We're only righteous by faith. But there are a lot of people who are self-righteous. Now, nah, I don't need Jesus. I'm good. And yet, here we see Christ bringing his, even him being Messiah for the first time to this broken woman. And I actually think there's a a method and a model for us here is that God is after us going to the broken. There's actually something sweet about evangelizing people like this woman. You notice, even though she ducks and dodges, she doesn't actually argue with Jesus about being a sinner. Why? Why? It's obvious. Everybody, I mean, it's just like, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, you got me. I'm a sinner. Okay, Lord, I'm convicted. Guilty as charged. You see, when we go to maybe the, 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 the self-righteous, the religious, the moral person, and we should evangelize them, that was our last session, they're actually sometimes the ones that we've got to convince you actually are a sinner. It's like, ah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm actually the best person on my block. Like, I'm the most moral, the most upright, the most good-standing citizen. I mean, I volunteer. I'm president of PTO. I mean, goodness gracious, I'm the person. I'm the guy. I'm the girl. But this is not this woman. Sometimes these are the people that they might come into church and we'd be like, ooh, almost like the James, like a little bit of prejudice, like sit over there. You don't look the part. You don't smell the part. You don't act the part. Yeah, they're broken by the sinfulness of this world. Go after that and see what Jesus does. So I think we can learn that from Christ. We can also learn that these, this idea of gospel-saturated or gospel-fluent people are willing to overcome cultural stigmas and barriers, barriers for the sake of bringing the hope of Jesus to the hopeless. It's not pretty. It's, it's messy, but it's glorious when we can offer the hope of Christ to hopeless people. Well, finally, and just briefly, I want to look at one more example, one more picture of brokenness Here in John 4, we see this gospel fluency moving you towards people that are broken by sin. But in John 9, we actually just see the gospel moves you towards people broken by suffering, right? That's John 9. John 9 is the classic story of the man born blind. 
And um, I just want to walk through it very quickly. We'll do it maybe five, ten minutes. Because I think the John 4 and John 9 are Jesus bringing hope to the hopeless. They're just hopeless for different reasons. So in John 9, it begins with bad theology, where it brings out a bad question. As, the, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples, okay, this is his disciples, not the Pharisees, Jesus' disciples. What's their question? Rabbi, come on, say it. Who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. So these, these, these men are under the impression, this is what we just call karma theology. It's alive and well today, it was alive and well then. If you do bad things, bad things come to you. If you do good things, good things come to you. That's not biblical theology, but it's human nature. It has been since the beginning of time. So who sinned, this man or his parents? And frankly, I think they're asking an age-old question. If you get to the heart of it, they're asking the question of evil. Why is there evil in the world? That's really where they're getting at. There's evil. This man's blind. That's evil. That is, that's practical evil. This is bad that this man never had a chance. He's been blind from birth. So somebody's got to have a fault. Talk about hopelessness. Do we see this around us today? I mean, there's, there's disease, there's pain, there's hopelessness. And frankly, people not, may, may not use the words who sinned, but there is this like, ooh, bad juju. Somebody did something for that to happen. And so these men have bad theology, and they ask a, a question that reveals their bad theology. And then Jesus actually moves the question, moves, moves to a totally different um, framework for these men. He says, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed through him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. And here we see that God's grace, or maybe let's say it this way, gospel grace reshapes our suffering. It reshapes how we think about suffering. Because what's Jesus doing? Yeah, this man's been born blind, but it's actually for a purpose to do what? To display God's works. And now we, in our humanity, we're just like, God, that's not fair. Just being honest, that's how we think. I mean, God, it's not fair. Why did that guy suffer for 36 years? I don't know. We, we, we're, God didn't give us that answer. But what he did tell us is, it's that I'm going to be glorified. So this man was born blind for a st distinct purpose, that I would be glorified. And so Jesus moves towards this blind man, he reshapes how his disciples think about suffering. And then in verse 7, he says, Go wash in the pool of Shalom, which means sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. So we see Jesus, he moves towards this person in need, and he heals the man. Now, we obviously don't have that ability. That'd be nice. But the moral of the story is not go heal blind people, okay? But Jesus is, one of the things that's fascinating in the life of Christ, he's constantly opening the eyes of the blind. Because it's physical, but he's also displaying spiritual realities, right? You're blind to me. You can't see me. So this man is, is now seeing. And then this man doesn't know very much. Look at verse 8. He doesn't know much at all except of one thing. I was healed. This guy named Jesus healed me. So the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some, some said it is, and others said, no, but it looks like him. And he kept saying, I'm the man. I, just, I wish I could have been there for these kind of like these back and forths. No, you're not the guy. No, he just looks like him. No, he's the guy. No, he's not the guy. No, he's, and he's, like, and he's, and he's right there like, I am the guy. I am the guy. I've been blind my whole life. Somebody believe me. You know, and he's just like, I, no, I know what happened to me. And they said to him, then how are your eyes open? <laughs> this is so classic. This man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes, and said, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. End of story. That's all I got, people. All I got is I was blind, now I see, and a guy named Jesus did it. I wouldn't have time to unpack the whole story, but man, he ends up getting fed to the wolves. They don't even care. The Jewish religious leaders, they don't care. He did it on the Sabbath. Who is this guy? I mean, and then this is, we talked about it last night. He's like, I've already told you. Do you want me to tell you again so you can believe? 
I mean, it's just like, what is going on here? With nobody celebrating the fact that I can now see. But I want, we're going to go to the end of the story. Just to sh- I want you to see the heart of Christ. Because we're still looking at how gospel-fluent people move towards people who are broken in their suffering. And this is just classic Jesus. He offers hope in the sense of healing this man's physical illness or his physical ailment. But look at verse, let's see here, 30, 33. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's the conclusion of the Pharisees. Then they answered him, you were, or no, this is, the, this is the man. The man says, if the man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's the man born blind. Then they answered him, you were born in utter sin. Remember, because somebody had to sin that he was born blind. Remember that? That's the logic of the Pharisees. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. So now you have a guy who can see, but he's kicked out of the synagogue, which is to be removed from the public square of society. You're persona non grata for the rest of your life because you're kicked out of the public square. You've got nothing. And in their day and age, you're you're not going to buy, sell, have a home. You're, You're outcast. So I can see, but I just got kicked out of society. What a day. This is not going well for this guy. But notice what happens next. Jesus heard they'd cast him out. And having found him, notice who found who. Jesus finds him. And he says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus goes and finds this man, and then Jesus is compelled to save this man. So he opens his eyes both physically and spiritually. And even though this man had had a very tumultuous day going from the joy of sight to being kicked out of society in a way, being rejected by his own people, he's now embraced by Christ. And I find this to be an insightful story when I think about how how we're compelled by God to go towards need and not comfort. Because there are people that society's rejected. Society's done with. For whatever reason, their families have kicked them out, society's kicked them out, and this is the one that Christ goes to. He seeks out this broken man, this man who has literally been seeing for who knows, a few hours, and is now already finding himself on the outside of society. And I just, I believe that there is a host of suffering in the world today. People broken simply because we lived in a cursed world. And Jesus is the only one who speaks into that brokenness and who's able to redeem that brokenness. So are we being the mouthpieces for Christ to speak into that brokenness? Or are we just wanting people that look pretty, look good, and have it all together? That's who we go after. It's not the heart of Christ. Christ went after those who were acutely broken and offered the hope of Christ. So one of the takeaways for me is that Jesus redeeming brokenness does not always equal physical healing. But, but, it does always mean they're no longer an enemy of God. And that's the healing that all people need, right? So hey, I can't promise you Jesus could heal you. We could pray to that end. I can't make mud and put it on your eyes. I can't fix your physical problems. But I can tell you this, you can go from being God's enemy to being God's friend. And I'll fix the ultimate brokenness of your soul for all eternity. And so, brothers and sisters, I would just challenge you to maybe jot that phrase down, meditate on it, pray over it, pray over it. Does does my love for the gospel move me towards need or comfort? Because I think if we have the heart of Christ, we're going to be going towards need. And and I don't have to get, we don't have to get too specific because need can look like so many different things, right? Right? Need can look like affluent people who are broken. Need can look like drug addicts who are broken. There is need, there's enough need in the world that we could be busy going towards need, not comfort, till the day we die. But it's the gospel that compels us to that because apart from the gospel, if we're honest, we go towards comfort every time. At least me, maybe not you. I'm not very masochistic. I love comfort. So I, I'm, I'm gravitating towards comfort. And it's the love of the gospel that reminds me that person's in need. Jesus loved you when you were in need. Press into their need. 
love them. But Lord, I don't want to love them. Lord, it's super inconvenient. Love them. Lord, it's going to be awkward. Love them. Lord, I don't have the time. Love them, right? The gospel presses us towards need, not comfort. And I believe those who know the gospel and love the gospel as Jesus did will be compelled to go towards need and not comfort, even though in our flesh we go the exact opposite direction. So brothers and sisters, the gospel, the gospel is sufficient to speak into the need of our broken world. Would you agree? And we have the only hope. I mean, we could go around this room right now and say, hey, tell me about Tell me about your life right now and the areas that it's broken. Now we could fill the rest of the day. But hopefully, if you're a child of God, you'd also say, we could also say, tell me how you have hope in Christ in the midst of your brokenness, right? And that's what we have to offer the world. We're not saying that life this side of heaven will be without pain. We are saying that you are at peace with God this side of heaven and for all eternity. And in that, we have hope. We are saying, hey, you can go to bed at night with no condemnation. You can actually have your sins forgiven, no shame, no guilt, because Jesus took it, and in that we have hope, right? And so we can offer hope at the level of our souls to a hopeless world. I love this line. We, we have the only present and eternal hope in this broken world, so we can take it to hopeless people, because we can identify, yeah, I've been there, maybe I am there, but Christ is my hope. All right, brothers and sisters, we're going to stop there.